Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm new to the Boston area, and um, it's exciting to see all of the opportunities to get involved in uh, seeing speakers about HCI topics uh, from all over the world coming here. Um, this talk is entitled Interface Design, Affect, and a Student's Choice to Game the System. I'll get into what that is in a minute. <coughs> this is work done in conjunction with a number of people, including Al Corbett and Ken Katinger and Vincent Olevin at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Didith Rodrigo at Ateneo de Manila in the Philippines, Sidi de Mello at Memphis, Adriana Di Carvalho, now at Worcester Polytechnic, uh, Joe Raspat, independent consultant, Ian Roll at the University of British Columbia, and Angela Wagner at Carnegie Mellon. So a lot of people have been involved in this, and uh, any mistakes in the work I present is all mine, but all the good stuff probably comes from them. So I'm gonna talk about gaming the system, and uh, then move into discussing why is it that students game the system. Uh, focusing particularly on um, affect and on software design factors and how that influences students' choices, and then go to some conclusions. And the methods I'll be discussing, and hopefully some of them will be of interest to some of the folks in this room, include quantitative field observation methods, uh, interface taxonomy development and usage, and educational data mining methods. So I'd, I'd like to start off by showing, uh, showing all of you how one student chose to use a cognitive tutor. Um, which is one of the many types of educational software where students game the system. Um, before I uh, show you this clip, I need to say a few words about what cognitive tutors are. Who here has heard a little bit about the cognitive tutors or intelligent tutors in the past? Okay, so a few people. So cognitive tutors these days are one of the more widely used AI, artificial intelligence-based educational technologies, and they've been developed for a variety of domains, uh, things like geometry, algebra, uh, chemistry and stoichiometry, genetics, LISP programming, largely in relatively well-defined domains. Um, and uh, the people who were the leaders in the, this work were Ken Katinger, Al Corbett, and John Anderson over there. And they're nowadays used in math courses in about 6% of USA middle schools and high schools, marketed by a spin-off company, including a few in the Boston area, although it's most prominently used in Pennsylvania, Florida, and Wisconsin. In a cognitive tutor for math, for instance, a student completes math problems, and much as they would do in a, home, a traditional homework assignment, but unlike a traditional homework assignment, the cognitive tutor gives the student feedback as they go through it and help based on the task analysis of the skills being taught and a model of student learning in the domain. So, uh, for example, here a student is labeling a scatter plot, and it, they can ask for help uh, at a conceptual level as they go. And if a student makes an error, uh, the Students input turns red, as shown there, and um, a box sometimes pops up when the student's error indicates a known misconception. So the software can actually identify this is not just the mistake you made, but it's why you made it, and give the student useful feedback based on that. And then the student is assigned new problems based on the skills that they haven't yet mastered. Uh, so for example, uh, you can see up here a list of the skills that are relevant to this mathematics task. And these bars indicate how close the student is to mastery for each of the skills. And when a student reaches mastery, the system can move them on to new material. So unlike a, a traditional homework assignment on paper, for instance, or even in many pieces of computer-aided instruction, where the student uh, has a fixed curriculum, this software adapts its curriculum to each student's mastery. So cognitive tutors are fairly educationally effective. They perform about a standard deviation uh, better than traditional classroom instruction, and that includes on standardized exams. Uh, which is one of the reasons why they become quite popular lately. They're still not as good as an expert one-on-one -on -one human tutor, which can do about two standard deviations better. And routinely, a small percentage of students just don't learn much at all. And uh, now I'm going to show you a clip of a 13-year-old female student in the Pittsburgh suburbs who was using a, a, a cognitive tutor that was, in particular, known to be effective. The average student learns about half of the material uh, that they achieves about half the potential pre-post game by pre-test to post-test, which is actually quite successful. Um, in this tutor, this student was, this was a tutor uh, for interpreting, creating and interpreting scatter plots of data. And this student, I'm um, gonna show you a part of the process where they're labeling the axes with values. They've already chosen appropriate variables for the two axes, given the data set. Now they need to uh, label the axes with the values and then they'll plot points and then interpret the data. They've actually already gone through a scaffold to help them uh, learn the process of, a ch of selecting appropriate bounds and scales for the axes. And in that, uh, they've chosen a lower bound for the x-axis of 45. So they're going to start labeling it 40 from 45. 
and a scale of 3. So the second value should be 45 plus 3, which is 48. For the y-axis, they've chosen a lower bound of 60. So now let's look at what the student actually did. And this is uh, real data uh, from a real student in our logs. And it was selected by an algorithm that can identify gaming a system, which we'll talk about in a sec. So the first thing the student does is place the value 0 as the first value of the x-axis. For this student, that was actually the correct answer on the previous problem. And it's frequently a good value to start a, a, a graph with. But in this case, it's not appropriate, and it's not what they already chose. So it turns red. Student then tries 0 on the y-axis, uh, which is also not correct. They try 1, which is not correct. They clear it out. They try 4 on the x-axis, which is not correct. At this point, they decide to ask for help. So they click uh, through the system's help, and they spend about 4.8 seconds reading two levels of help and typing in the next answer. I say help, uh, reading in quotes because that's faster than almost all expert adult speed readers can handle. But it says, label the leftmost blank of the x-axis of 45 at the end. And the student types in 45, and it's correct. She then tries 45 on the y-axis, where it's not correct. And she uh, asks for help again. She spends about five and a half seconds reading three levels of help. This is actually at a speed that's about what expert adult speed readers can do. And she types in the next answer. It says, label, at the end, label the second blank of the x-axis from the left with 48. But instead, she puts it on the y-axis, where it's wrong. She asks for help again, spends six and a half seconds reading the exact same help, and typing in the next answer. 48 in the same place. It's still wrong. At this point, she reads the same help a third time, and at this point, puts it in the correct place. So who thinks that this student learned a lot from using the tutor? Raise your hands. Yeah. They may have learned a lot about how to uh, subvert educational technology, but they probably didn't learn much math. And in fact, uh, this student got 0% on the pretest, which um, in the education business, we say this means she has a lot of room to learn and to grow. <laughs> and then she successfully completes five problems in the tutor, which is more than the average student was able to do in this period of time, and is usually associated with good learning. And then she gets 0% on the post-test. In other words, this student was successfully able to generate and interpret five scatter plots of data without, as far as we can tell, learning a single thing about scatter plots. Which is really actually pretty impressive when you get right down to it. <laughs> so the clip I showed you is an instance of a behavior that we call gaming a system. And we define it as attempting to get correct answers and advance in a curriculum by taking advantage of the software's helper feedback rather than by actively thinking through the material. And in intelligent tutors like the one you saw, it consists of behaviors like systematic guessing. And you saw a little bit of that there, but it's also things like trying every single number quoted in the problem statement. Or for example, one student tried 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on to 38, which was the answer. It's also help abuse, which in systems like this one usually consists of asking for a hint, and instead of reading it, just going next hint, next hint, next hint, next hint, until it gives you the answer. Gaming. Some people, uh, when we first started talking about this work at CHI in 2004, said this is just because cognitive tutors are very constrained learning environments, and that's why people game the system. But in fact, gaming the system has been observed in various types of educational games, including Magnuson and Misfelt's work, where in a collaborative learning game where students get points for helping each other, students form point cartels where they, in where they uh, intentionally make errors on easy material so that their fellow student can help them. Um, it's been observed in graded participation news groups. Uh, Cheng and Vasileva showed that people do spam posts in these kind of news groups. Um, and even in human teachers giving help. Amy Arberton had some great observational uh, field work in classrooms where she showed that in classrooms with multiple teacher's aides, a student will say, oh no, help me. I can't get this material and ask teacher's aide A. Get the answer and then go to teacher's aide B. Hey, help me, I can't get this material. And kind of iterate through all the items across the different teacher's aides. So this is kind of a very widespread behavior uh, across a wide variety of educational settings. <coughs> gaming system has been shown in several studies to be associated with statistically significantly poor learning in cognitive tutors and related types of educational software. I'm not entirely sure why learning has only been studied in cognitive tutors for this behavior, but so far it has been. Uh, but our group has had five studies. Levin had one, uh, Beck at Worcester Polytechnic. One of my new colleagues, and Walnoski and Heffernan, another set of my new colleagues had them. Uh, Kucha et al. in the UK. <coughs> and um, 
<coughs> across the studies our group has done, if you take two students with identical pretest, um, the student who never games the system uh, has, good has very good learning, and the student who games the system about a third of the time learns about half as much. And in reality, actually, it's a little more complex because usually students who game the system start a little bef below the rest of the class. They start below and they fall further behind where they would be if they hadn't gamed. So you might ask, does all gaming lead to poor learning? And in fact, it doesn't. Some students who game the system still have positive learning. Uh, we've identified, and our colleagues have identified, two types of behaviors of this nature. First of all, if you game the system on material you've already learned, but perhaps the system hasn't yet figured out that you've already learned it, uh, it doesn't hurt your learning on that material. But it does slow you down from advancing a new material. Um, and also, some students click through the hints at high speed to get the answer. They type it in, and then they stop, and they self-explain it. And that actually turns out to be a very good strategy for students who have very low knowledge to begin with. Uh, it's very productive. It's rare. But when students do that, it's actually quite good. And Ben Shi actually got uh, the best paper award at Educational Data Mining 2008 for that work. Uh, lovely work. <coughs> so as you might imagine, um, a problem of this scope and this generality, people have tried to develop learning systems that can intervene. Um, and uh, I know of four such examples. Um, one of them, um, the one that I was involved in, we took an automated sector of gaming. I won't talk about that today, but in its current form, it can tell a gaming student from a non-gaming student 96% of the time. So it's pretty accurate. And we had an animated software agent, shown at the bottom. Um, graphics shamelessly stolen uh, from Microsoft Office Agent, but it doesn't do that in Microsoft Office Agent. And it responds to gaming in two ways, with supplementary exercises that give students an alternate way to learn the material that they've bypassed by gaming, and with emotional expressions, such as this one when the student isn't gaming, and this one when the student games during a supplementary exercise. Uh, this had the effect of reducing gaming by about half and significantly improving gaming students' learning. Um, as I mentioned previously, without interventions like this, gamers start behind and fall further behind. With this, they start behind and catch up. Um, however, the intervention annoyed many students. Um, people found it very irritating that it kept popping up and giving, saying, I don't think you learned this, let's try a different way. And um, other students found it the most delightful thing ever to try to get uh, Scooter to get that angry. And so they would uh, kind of sit down in class and, and uh, co compete, and they'd all have Scooter looking happy, and they'd say, all right, who can get him mad first? Another problem is that the intervention is difficult to scale. I haven't shown you an example of the supplementary exercises, but quite a bit of time went into designing them. <coughs> and uh, scaling it up throughout an entire year's curriculum is gonna, would be difficult. And that's actually been a pro problem with all of the previous attempts to address gaming through direct interventions. They've all been hard to scale. So the question is, can we do better? <coughs> and part, our main research direction in order to try to figure out, can we make better ways of adapting uh, educational software to gaming is to find out more about why students game the system. So why do students game? Why are we interested in that? Well, uh, beyond helping us design better interventions, uh, we think that it might be able, we might be able to just cut off the problem to begin with, design educational software that students don't choose to game. Some of the early work in this, uh, people tried to just make it so that you couldn't click through the hints at high speed, for example, with pauses, um, or that you couldn't systematically guess because it would pause um, after you tried a few things. The problem is that many students don't game. And so I'm just going to plug it in. Okay. Thank you very much. Beyond that, it may be scientifically interesting. The phenomenon of, <coughs> of misuse of technology, I think, is an interesting one to the HCI community as a whole. And the phenomenon of behaviors like this in the classroom has been of interest for over 100 years. You can look back to papers from the 1880s where people are bemoaning students not engaging properly in class and not taking it seriously. So up until the work I'm going to present, the predominant research was, how do stable and semi-stable student individual differences lead students to game? And a lot of time and energy went into trying to find stable and semi-stable student individual differences um, and their association in gaming. And I'm not proud to say that I spent a lot of time on this myself. Um, several of these papers have my name on them. Um, some significant relationships were found. Students who dislike the subject matter, who dislike math, are more likely to game. Students who dislike computers are more likely to game. Students who have lack of educational self-drive 
You can also think of this as conscientiousness from the personality scales. Students who aren't conscientious in educational settings tend to game. None of this is rocket science, and also the relationships are really weak. Um, you know, they predict like four to nine percent of the variance in gaming. And this is after about six or seven studies by various different research groups. <laughs> so one thing we thought of is that perhaps stem stable or semi-stable student individual differences are not the main type of factor explaining gaming. And we actually uh, did some data mining studies across large populations and saw that students weren't even very consistent uh, from tutor lesson to tutor lesson in who gamed, which is another piece of evidence in favor of this. Uh, two hypotheses that we came up with when we started, when this pattern started to become clear, and we started to realize we'd wasted um, three years of hard work, were that um, perhaps a aspects of the student state, you know, the classic state or trait dichotomy, are predictive, and in particular, perhaps affect. Uh, we observed a lot of strong affect in students gaming the system in the field. Um, another thing was educational software design. You know, perhaps it's our fault. Perhaps we're the ones making them game by our bad design. Yeah. Sure, I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> jargon, uh, jargon land. Um, affect is the student's, um, broadly it's the student's emotional state, but, emotion, but it's the emotions that are particularly relevant to the task at hand. So for example, um, things like joy or sorrow, which are kind of classic Ekman emotions, are not, uh, well, DeMello and Art Gracer in that group at Memphis have argued that they're not particularly relevant during education. And there's been a community arguing that instead states like, and I'll get into more detail in a bit, but states like boredom, uh, deep engagement, confusion, frustration, kind of lower, lower um, intensity states, uh, but states that are kind of focused on the task at hand are more relevant for studying education. Is that? Oh, affective learning? I'm not sure I know that, uh, that field. Um, I know about, do you mean the work at uh, MIT Media Lab with Picard, or do you mean some other group? Short answer is I don't actually know, because I don't know that. But I'd actually love to hear about some of those references uh, later on. I'm always looking to expand my knowledge of that. So thank you very much. Yeah. Can you establish a baseline with these students? Could these students identify the X and Y axis? Could these students increment by one? Well, they could definitely increment by one. That's a behavior that we saw fairly routinely. Um, based on the pretest, some students actually couldn't identify the x and y axes, though many could. Um, and in fact, a lot of our materials aren't focused as much on the terms x and y axis. Uh, we tend to remind students that x is the horizontal and y is the vertical, because we're more interested in students understanding how to, how to use the axes and how to represent data with them and interpret data with them than we are in the terminology at use. One mistake actually it's very common with creating uh, graphs of data, of numerical data, is that students um, have a, a very common misconception to think that all data, is, all representations are bar graphs, even if they've got dots. So everything should have categorical on one axis and a numerical on the other one. And that actually was a big focus of the tutor lesson that we were studying. I don't know if that was a useful answer, but OK. Any other questions? This is actually very nice. Thank you for the clarification questions and the probing. Great. Feel free to interrupt me at any point, please. So let me now talk about our work on uh, affect. And then I'll talk about our work on software design. So we conducted two studies on student affect and the choice to game the system. In the first study, we had uh, 36 students who had never used the learning system I'm going to show you. And it wasn't actually an intelligent tutor in the study. It was an educational game, The Incredible Machine. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, it involved a fairly wide age range, and this was a classroom in the Philippines uh, with my colleague uh, Mercedes Dith Rodrigo. So students between 14 and 19 years old, they tend to have broader age ranges there than we do. Uh, neither gifted nor special needs, and a private school in Manila. And in this system, there were the same overall behaviors as in a cognitive tutor, hint abuse and systematic gaming. So who here's uh, played The Incredible Machine before? 
It um, actually has been through several incarnations, and it's won awards in, in, in each of its many incarnations. It's been one of the stickiest uh, games out there in terms of the kind of serious game world. Um, in terms of, I think the first version was in the early 90s, and there was a version that came out just a year ago for mobile computers. So it's been very popular over the years, and it's used uh, for logic education in a few places. <coughs> not, not that prominently in the United States, but that's because logic education is not that prominent in high schools and middle schools here as it used to be. At any rate, in The Incredible Machine, you solve a series of Rube Goldberg puzzles. Um, in this one, for example, you have to get the basketballs into this enclosure. And you get these objects. And they're, they're relatively open-ended problems compared to many intelligent tutors in that there's often multiple solutions you can take to achieve your goals. And what you can do to game the system is you can um, systematically guess. You can just put all the available objects in various locations. You can also ask for hints. And then it tells you uh, where you should be placing objects. And then you can systematically guess from there, having constrained the problem. So it's broadly the same kinds of gaming a system that can occur. Our method for assessing gaming and affect was quantitative field observations, which I'll give you details on in a sec. Uh, and we had quantitative field observations of gaming and affect by six coders as these students were using the software in the field. Um, and what it was is a group of students were repeatedly observed by our coding team. Um, there were 20 second observation periods. So if I was observing Doug, I would um, stand observing him for 20 seconds and note down the first behavior he engaged in that was notable. And in fact, while I was doing it, I wouldn't be looked, hovering over his shoulder. I'd be hovering over Aaron's shoulder and observing him out of peripheral vision. And that's really important uh, for our method to, minimal, to affect students as minimally as possible. We conduct the observations in ways that the students know that there's observation going on, but they don't know they're being observed right now. Um, we do the observations in a predetermined order to get, over, to get uh, the cleanest possible data um, in terms of having uh, not just the most salient events, but having all events when they occurred. Um, so it's a sampling We try to sample in as uh, neutral a fashion as possible. Um, oh, and one other thing I didn't mention here is that we actually desensitize students usually for an entire class period before we do our observations. So the observers go around for an entire class period while the students are doing some other activity that's not of interest to us. And we're doing the same kind of observations, but we just throw it all out at the end. And the benefit to doing that in fact, they don't take the same attention while they're doing it. It gets our, tr our coders trained up and comfortable in the situation, and it gets the students used to us. It, our, our experience has been that it takes about a third to a half of a class period, 15, 20 minutes, to get students to stop, to stop seemingly paying attention to us. Uh, the behavioral codes we used were the same codes that we'd used in our first gaming the system research. So we coded whether a student was, um, most importantly, gaming the system, but also on task in the software, or engaging in on-task conversation with a teacher or another student, or engaging in off-task conversation, perhaps discussing uh, the popular movie in the cinema this week, engaging in off-task solitary behavior like reading a magazine, um, or just completely inactive for the 20-second period. And uh, this is by far the most common category anywhere we've studied. Um, and frequently, this tends to be this, these two tend to be about equally common. Gaming system is usually pretty rare. Um, and we had acceptable iterator reliability in the study, cap of 0.7. The affect codes were drawn from Sidney DeMello's work at the University of Memphis. He and Art Gracer and their colleagues kind of studied what affective states are most salient to students in learning situations. And it included uh, flow or deep engagement, it can also be thought of. Uh, frustration, confusion, delight, surprise, boredom, and neutral. And you might ask, how can our observers uh, catch these things? Actually, students in these kind of classrooms are incredibly verbal about what their affect is and incredibly demonstrative. It's actually much easier in the field than it is in the lab because students will slouch, they'll sigh, they'll pound their fists on the table, they'll drum their fingers on the keyboard. Um, and we got good iterator reliability, at least acceptable, kappa 0.63. Yeah, so what we looked at in this data was, if a student is in a certain affect state now, how likely are they going to be gaming the system in one minute? Um, and uh, what this graph shows is how frequent is gaming one minute after the affective state. The average frequency of gaming is this black line. Uh, and the bars are, after you've been in flow, deeply engaged, gaming the system is actually significantly less likely than if you weren't in flow. But if you're confused or bored, it's significantly more likely, or weirdly enough, neutral. The neutral is, 
Neutral kind of tends to be a catch-all category where students just aren't being demonstrative about their affect. And what, what bleeds into neutral can often be uh, different between cultures. So we haven't focused much on the neutral. We focus on the ones where it's clear. Neutral is fairly rare. So in other words, um, a student who's confused or bored is significantly more likely to start gaming a minute from now. And this effect was even greater among students who were frequently bored. If you took the subset of students who were bored more than a third of the time, um, they gamed about four times as much after they were bored. So what about after gaming? When a student games, what happens next? Well, um, if you were confused and you game, you're not confused afterwards. Gaming leads to significantly less confusion, which at a level makes sense. You don't know what to do, you game, you get past it. You're no longer confused. However, if you're bored, you're significantly more likely to be bored after you game. So um, what it leads to is kind of a vicious cycle. Bored, I'm bored, I game. I'm bored, I'm still bored, so I game some more. So the overall picture is that a student will be bored or confused or neutral, and they'll game the system. And they actually often become frustrated while they game. Um, they aren't frustrated before they game, but if you can imagine, if you're trying to game just to get through and you still can't get it, that's going to be really frustrating. So uh, afterwards, they tend to only be bored. So bottom line, boredom leads to gaming. Gaming doesn't alleviate boredom. Confusion leads to gaming. Gaming alleviates confusion. Will this result replicate in an intelligent tutoring system? Which is the focus of our second study. So we took 140 students in a math class who hadn't previously used the tutor I'm going to show you. Um, the students were between 12 and 15, neither gifted nor special needs. Four schools in Manila, one school in the rural Philippines, and a short uh, study involving an intelligent tutor called Aplusix um, that's very popular. It's actually not widely used in the United States, but it's very widely used outside the United States, particularly in France, Brazil, and the Philippines. And the same kinds of gaming behavior as a cognitive tutor. Uh, hint abuse and systematic guessing. Here's um, a picture of Aplusix. It's actually a much drier intelligent tutoring system than the cognitive tutors. It doesn't have the pictures and the graphs and the scenarios that cognitive tutors do. It just has equation solving. <coughs> same observational study technique used as in the previous study. Exact same. Almost all the same observers, too. Uh, we've done pretty well with retaining our research, our research assistants and associates in that group. One kind of interesting result that I really don't know what to tell you at the moment, but it'll become relevant when we talk about the interface design stuff in the next section, is that there was significantly less gaming in Aplusix than in this game. Um, in intelligent tutors in the States, in the cognitive tutors, students game about 3% of the time. In Aplusix, they gamed about 1.5% of the time, which is a bit lower than that. But in the game, they, uh, they gamed about twice as much. When we first saw this, we thought maybe students just game more in the Philippines than they do in the States. But concerning the behavior in Aplusix, it really looks like it's a difference between the learning environments. And again, I'll get into some of why that might be when we talk about uh, the intelligent to, uh, our in-depth study of interface features and gaming system in the next section. In this study, boredom was still significantly associated with future gaming. In fact, it was a stronger effect. If you're bored, you're seven times more likely to start gaming in the next minute. Uh, however, confusion was not associated with future gaming in this tutor, and nor was frustration. Um, gaming didn't precede any affective state more than be expected by chance. So in other words, whereas in the incredible machine, boredom and confusion led to gaming, in Aplusix, uh, only boredom did. And whereas boredom w was a result of gaming in uh, the incredible machine, nothing was more common afterwards in Aplusix. So, Large, uh, oh, and also frustration was co-occurred co with gaming system in Aplusix as it did in the Incredible Machine. Yeah? Excellent question. It was comparable. <laughs> Students were bored, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, about t 12 to 15 percent of the time in both systems. In both systems, flow, uh, deep engagement, was kind of the dominant state. And that's in part because these are new environments for these students. They haven't largely seen them before. Um, confusion was also pretty prominent, about the same frequency as boredom. Frustration a little bit rarer, and uh, neutral, rarer still, and delight. Delight was incredible, almost non-existent in Apollo 6. It was present in the incredible machine. And that's probably due to the difference between a game and a tutor. Uh, in fact, in some of our other work, we've found that uh, delight 
tends to be one of the things that really differentiates between games and tutors. Flow, deep engagement, tends to be fairly comparable. So there's kind of consistent evidence that boredom leads to gaming across types of learning environments. Um, there's some evidence that boredom may not alleviate, that gaming may not alleviate boredom in the educational game, but it may do so in the ITS. We're not entirely shy, sure why that is yet. Um, and in the educational game, but not the ITS, confusion leads to gaming and gaming alleviates confusion. Yeah? There's at least some theory that says that very bright kids can explore in school. Could that be associated with gaming? You give me this thing instead of doing what you want, I'm just going to play the game instead of, yeah. as part of being not. Not caused by boredom, but being caused by the same thing that causes the boredom. Right. So a large amount of our evidence seems to, from the states and from our earlier work seems to suggest that gaming is pretty strongly associated with uh, poor educational uh, attainment, not just on the material they're gaming on, but in general. If you take their uh, kind of their standardized test scores, uh, students who are generally more poorly performing in school tend to be the ones who game. Um, that's not to say that they're not smarter, right? Some students who are very smart have low levels of educational attainment because they're bored by school. Um, we don't have any data to address that one one way or the other. So it's, it's a very valid point. We've tended to think of those students as being the less, the less they're the less uh, achieving ones, but that is a somewhat of a different construct. That's right, yeah. <coughs> Doing IQ, well, sorry, one, just, just one comment and I'll get to you. Um, administering IQ tests is something we haven't been able to do in the schools we work with uh, because uh, that's generally considered privileged data. So kind of direct measures of intelligence are kind of hard to come by in what we're doing. Yeah. Almost invariably, gaming leads to faster than average performance, but it's not the fastest. Uh, students who, uh, I think, well, actually that's kind of confounded, because the students who go the fastest through are the ones who already have high levels of knowledge of the material. I would suspect that if you really were stuck, you'd get through faster by gaming on the whole than you would by doing the kind of deep learning strategies that lead to uh, robust learning like self-explanation. Self-explanation is a notoriously slow strategy. I think it's a very productive one for learning. So I suspect that gaming, if your goal is to get through as quickly as possible, gaming would be a pretty good thing to do. Why is that desirable? I don't think it is desirable. Oh, you mean why do they? Why is getting through faster more fun than getting to play the game longer? You know, it, it, it depends what you regard it as a um, doing it. So it's also co competitiveness. You know, Schofield and her uh, ethnographic uh, research in schools shows that when students get into educational software, they often have this uh, desire, especially the boys, boys more than girls in this, although gaming is not particularly gender-oriented, um, they tend to want to, s to prove who can get through faster. So that's one of the factors. For example, in The Incredible Machine, there's a certain number of problems and there's a certain machismo in being able to say, I got through six, how many you got through? Do you have a question back there? That is an excellent question, um, and one that there's a lot of people studying. Um, that is a wonderful question, and that's actually a segue for my, my next part of the talk. So let me answer that a little later, and if you're not happy with my answer, uh, ask me again. Now, 
interestingly enough, in the mid-90s, kids, when they used these kind of intelligent tutors, really were excited about them. They were something very novel and new in schools. They were much more engaging than existing practices. Students would do things, like students in very low, achie low achieving students in low achieving urban schools would come to class 10 minutes early just to be able to spend some more time on the software or would work on it in their lunch breaks. You don't see that anymore. <clears throat> I don't know when that stopped, but it certainly isn't the case anymore. Um, unfortunately, I guess the other media that students are exposed to has gotten significantly better while cognitive tutors have been pretty flat. So, yeah. What's an example of self-explanation? Oh, so that'd be, um, I'm not sure I can do it very convincingly on the fly, but let's say that they, uh, they don't know what the answer is. And so they go click, click, click through the hints. And they see the answer seven and they go, they type it in, it's right, and they go, why is the answer seven? That's so weird. And then they may even go back and read the earlier hints and kind of say, ah, maybe it's because of x. No, it's not because of x. Well, maybe it's because of y. Ah, it is because of y. Self-explaining, um, Mickey Chi has done some work on the, the learning strategies people use. And self-explanation, though time consuming, tends to be one of the most effective things you can do. There's actually been increasing work showing that the paradigm of just giving lots of, lots of practice doesn't turn out to be nearly as good as giving a practice problem and then a, a worked example which students are led to, through self-explanation. And then more practice, and then more self, and so interleaving things. And Ron Salden, who uh, was a colleague of mine at Carnegie Mellon, did some wonderful work showing that if you can lead students to self-explain the reasons for a correct answers and actually get them to do it, that turns out to be massively more effective than even really excellently designed uh, practice problems. Again, you have to have a combination. Just worked examples actually isn't as good as just practice. Do you have a question? <laughs> Give a comment on the issue of why students might be bored. Uh, as soon as you uh, start to pay someone to do an activity that is intrinsically fun for itself, or presumably require them to in a school setting, it stops being intrinsically fun. This is a really old find. That's right. You can do it with monkeys and give them a puzzle, and they'll spend hours playing with the puzzle. You put a peanut in, they'll open a peanut and a puzzle. It's one of the inherent problems with our move in our, our country's school system towards greater standardized testing. There have been considerable advantages to that move. It's a very controversial sub thing with you know, success, benefits for both sides. But I think it does reduce intrinsic engagement to some degree. There has been some evidence of that. Great. Well, lots of great questions and comments. Thank you. So now I'm going to talk about our third study which wasn't really a classic study, it was more of a, a data mining study, on uh, fact, ways that software design impacts the choice to game the system. So the question is, what features of educational software are associated with more gaming? In other words, if it's present, students game more. And what are those features? And it's operationalized in, as in a set of tutor lessons, which are game to varying degrees, um, what are the differences between tutor lessons that predict the differences in the frequency of gaming? Or in other words, how much of the variance in gaming does each difference predict? <coughs> Our method was to combine assessments of gaming frequency with information about the differences between lessons <coughs> to determine which differences between lessons predict the variance in gaming frequency and how much. So we took the data from an entire school year's use of a cognitive tutor, lesson for, a cognitive tutor for algebra, uh, 22 lessons within the algebra cognitive tutor, there were actually 10 more, but those were mostly short or at the end of the school year, and so we didn't have enough data. Um, we took data from 59 students in the PSLC data shop. Uh, Doug already gave a little bit of a commercial for that, um, but I'll repeat it, saying that it's large and it's really cool, and it was a privilege to be involved with it. Uh, this involved 436,000 actions within the tutor, uh, which involved actions defined as entering an answer or requesting help. Uh, at this point, this was already, this data set was collected by a year and a half ago. Um, and it was chosen in part because of its broad coverage by the same set of students. But we actually have, um, a, well, hundreds of millions of student actions in different learning environments. Processing them all is, is a bit of a task. But we labeled gaming in this study with text replays, 
which was a method that enabled us to label large amounts of data. We have machine learning detectors, but we hadn't validated them on every single lesson. It might be that they're, le for example, if they caught gaming more often than it actually occurred or less often than it actually occurred in a specific lesson, we'd have artifactual evidence for more or less gaming. So instead what we did was we had um, an observer label, uh, label, we pretty printed segments of the log files, had an observer label them. So this is a clip uh, from, the, from the text replace software. This is real student data. And what it shows is a certain amount, as time elapses, what was the student's behavior. So this student got a right answer at time zero. 20 seconds later, they had to enter an answer and they entered minutes. And it said, uh, it gave a bug. And then four seconds later, they entered hour. And then seven seconds later, they entered years. And then 14 seconds later, they entered week. So they were trying all the units. And every time it gave them a bug message, and that bug message, which the student didn't read, actually was, you're not supposed to enter the units here. But the student was kind of trying every single unit they could. And so a unit observer can look at this and label it as being gaming or not gaming. This actually tends to agree pretty well with our algorithm. Uh, but we were able to trust it more closely in lessons that we'd never been in the field for. And this allows us to infer how much each student was gaming a system in each lesson. Um, Integrator reliability is in the 0.6 range. It's decent. Not quite as good as live observations, which as we looked at before, given the 0.65 to 0.7 range. Um, our coder generated 18,000 labels in 206 hours. It's about 39.6 seconds per label. Um, believe it or not, our coder actually found this task fun. This, it's important to find the right person for this kind of job. <laughs> Yes, that's right. In fact, actually, the first person I hired for this job um, came very well recommended. And this person, after doing a couple hundred, started gaming a system and just kind of doing random stuff. But we, I actually did checks where I um, coded it myself and found this person getting to almost chance with me. And so we actually uh, switched coders to this new person who did a really excellent job. At the same time, so this gave us a representation of game, amount of game for each student. We also developed what we called the Cognitive Tutor Lesson Variation Space, um, which is a representation of the differences between tutor lessons. And it's 79 features that a tutor lesson can have, and I'll give you examples in a minute. First, I want to go through how we developed it. It's a little warm in here. Or I'm a little warm in this coat. Um, so the first thing we did was assemble a team, um, which involved three Cognitive Tutor designers with expertise in cognitive psychology and artificial intelligence. One researcher specializing in the study of gaming system, me. Um, a math teacher with several years of experience using cognitive tutors in class. And a designer of non-computerized curricula who had never previously used a cognitive tutor. So trying to get a variety of different angles on what might differentiate two cognitive tutor lessons. The next step was to generate a long list of features. Uh, each participant who had previously used a cognitive tutor separately sat down and from memory, without looking at anything, wrote down a list of all of the things that could differentiate two tutors. And after that, four of our participants went through every single lesson in this curriculum and wrote down additional features that came to mind after they looked at it. And then, um, uh, and one of those people was the person who'd never seen a cognitive tutor before this. And then uh, I did a, a fairly extensive literature review on the design of educational software and intelligent tutoring systems to find other potential features. And that gave us a brief list of 569 ways that tutor lessons can differ. The next step was to narrow that list down a bit. And so our criteria were, can multiple team members understand the feature? Didn't necessarily have to be everybody. For example, in particular, the person who'd never seen a tutor before this whole process often didn't know what we were talking about. And the cognitive psychologist used terminology very different from the teacher. Second thing is, in the team's judgment, could they reliably code it? Was it something that people could probably get agreement on? Or was it something that, in, with my expertise as an educational data miner, I thought we could actually develop, uh, develop a code to actually do the mining directly from, from log files or from software files? Um, third one was, does the feature split the list into two significantly sized groups? We made exceptions for certain kinds of bugs, because bugs, by, by definition, are going to be rare. But in general, we wanted features that, uh, that we could say, whatever this feature is, it'll divide the list. It won't just be like 19 lessons in one group and three in another one. And of course, for numerical features, this isn't an issue at all. But it's more for categorical or binary ones. And finally, in the team's judgment, do we think this feature actually has a chance of being associated with gaming a system? Because it's not worth doing all this coding task if we don't even think it's going to be worth it, has even a tiny chance of being worth anything. 
And the result was 113 features. The next step, uh, three team members coded the 113 features for 22 lessons in cognitive tutor algebra. We didn't do interrater reliability checks. And the reason is because this is a hypothesis generating exercise. We're trying to find out what differentiates tutors that might predict gaming. We're going to go back later, and I'll talk about this in future work, and actually do some f uh, more thorough checks for the features that actually turn out significant. It's a lot of work to do interrater reliability checks for 113 features if say, three of them turn out to be significantly associated with the construct at hand. And uh, 34 features actually turned out to be intractable during coding. Uh, while we didn't do formal interrater reliability checks, we still kind of had sessions where team members would do a few together and make sure they agreed, and then do another session, kind of standard practice. And if they couldn't converge after a couple of sessions, we threw the feature out, because it was just going to be too much work to do. The result was 79 features. 69 were coded by hand, 10 by data mining. We then did a kind of a quick double checking across all of these. One of the other coders would go through something that, the, if I coded something, one of the other coders would go back through it and, and double check it. And that way we could, less formal than actually doing full interrater reliability checks, but would give us some ability to check that what, was do, what we were doing was sane. Uh, one feature was found to not have good agreement, so we threw that feature out. And actually during the analysis, we added a new feature. I'll say more about that in a sec. So we ended up again with 79 features. A few examples of what kind of features that we had. Uh, feature 23 is, hints are not associated with better future performance. If a hint is any good, the student should learn something from it. And on the next problem, in general, the student should do better at this problem step. If it doesn't, if that's not the case, then the help is probably pretty ineffective. And that'd be a reason, what we thought, maybe why students would game the system. <laughs> feature 27 was, what proportion of hints are abstract? They don't refer to the, co the problem itself. They're, they're not concrete. Um, uh, feature 50 was, what percentage of the problem statements that introduce the mathematics involve fantasy of some sort? For example, being a rock star. Feature 53, and I'm, I'm just giving kind of a selection of the kind of features we coded here. <laughs> feature 53 was, how many words do the problem sa statements have that's not directly related to math? This generally represents, con almost always represents content that's there to increase interest. Um, 59 is, what percentage of, of steps are multiple choice? That might be something that would encourage students to game because it's easy to game them. If you have four choices, all you do is, and you'll get the answer one of those four times. And finally, do hints give explicit metacognitive advice? Some tutors have this, this advice on, you should really self-explain, or you, know, you should really uh, think through this in this fashion before you go on, and others don't. And maybe that's something that uh, discourages gaming. So we took these uh, 79 features, and in order to avoid just doing 79 statistical tests and having all the problems that go along with that, we distilled them into six components using principal component analysis. We actually got similar results with more components than that. Um, but for tractability, I'll just talk about this case. And we use these six components to predict the frequency of gaming in each tutor lesson. And um, one of these six uh, components was significantly associated with gaming a system. It got an R square of 0.29, which means it predicted 29% of the variance in gaming. That was statistically significant. This factor was strongly loaded on eight features, including um, ineffective hints. Ineffective hints lead to more gaming. Um, more abstract hints lead to more gaming. Are, I should say are associated with, except that this is kind of a quasi-experiment, because it's not like more gaming can make the hints more abstract. Um, and having more words in the problem statements that aren't directly related to math, in other words, more interest increasing text, less gaming. And that kind of goes along with uh, the, board, the evidence on boredom we had a, minute, a few minutes ago. In addition, uh, if the same number was used for multiple constructs in the problem, which can be confusing to students, how is there 17 showing up three different times, meaning three different things, there's more gaming. If it's not immediately apparent what the icons in the toolbar mean, there's more gaming. Yeah. That's actually not true. Uh, you, you, it'd be reasonable to hypothesize to surmise that. What happens is um, cognitive tutor algebra was first used in a classroom about 1990. And um, in the years since then, different groups have kind of come through uh, uh, the Carnegie Mellon Research Group or through the spin-off company, Carnegie Learning, with new ideas about how to do it. When improvements occur, they kind of occur non, 
Nah, they don't occur everywhere. They occur in certain places. The, um, in fact, I didn't get into this, but one of the best predictors that a lesson is going to be heavily gamed is if it was in the first batch that were developed back in the, early, the late 80s, early 90s, and that have been not, mo not modified heavily since. So that actually was kind of an early sign to us that design was, was going to be a factor. Now, to take the broader spirit of your question, if we had um, taken a wider cross-section of learning environments, we would have seen bigger differences. Um, and that might have made this even a little easier to spot. It would have been a little less tractable. This was already a fairly uh, painfully large project. And one of, the, one of the nice things about having lessons from a single tutor was we could focus in on these kind of design features because they were all on the same basic types of material. Absolutely. Um, that's not in the explicit future work plan because I don't have funding for it and I don't have a specific collaborator on that yet. But I really would like to see, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I, I think that this can form the basis of design principles for the design of educational systems that students don't choose to game. And in order to validate that, we first have to val I think we first have to validate in this case and show that these principles are actually going to make a difference in cognitive tutors. But after that, we have to validate it somewhere else too. Um, and uh, I'm, I haven't selected a system to do that in yet, but I'm definitely, if you know of anybody who'd be interested in collaborating in this, that'd be great. Yeah? I'm just curious about the black thing. It's not immediately apparent what icons on the toolbar mean. Because more gaming, because that just keeps confusion in the system about what gaming is. Um, in other words, the behavior of being confused about the icon looks like you're gaming the icons are things like <coughs> plot a point or draw a line or things like that. And I can't say for sure that's not the case because I haven't explicitly looked at, the, at this issue. Um, but I think that the gaming behavior seen are still kind of not just clicking icons because that wouldn't, that actually, the clicking of the icon is actually not logged. It's the entering of an answer. So for example, plotting a point once you're there. But of course, if you're confused about point plotting versus line drawing, you might draw point a plot when plot a point when you meant to draw a line. So I can't rule that out. Although that wouldn't be relevant, I'm sorry. That wouldn't be relevant in mo in more than a few tutor lessons. Uh, I'm wondering if you considered um, how practical the problem was. Um, so for example, the first one you put up is <coughs> Daily lives is that, I mean, that, that issue of practicality of students is actually a fairly hard one to assess. Our problems are actually chosen because they're relevant to students' day-to-day -day lives. Where uh, that problem is actually making an reductio ad absurdum where the student has to plot, uh, where the student has to plot uh, studying versus grades, and then they have to look at a spurious relationship, which in this case is height versus grades. And uh, that one is intended to teach uh, how spurious relationships look different. The examples are from students' daily lives, but of course, they're not relevant. Relevancy to the world of work and fantasy are both features in our model. Neither of those turned out to be significant. Um, however, those assessments of, wor of world of work were, were done by the teacher and with, uh, with uh, our curriculum designer checking them. So I can't really know, we don't really know if that catches whether students saw it as practical. Right, and the problems are actually a scatter. The problems are mostly of three types. They're trying to be four types. World of work related problems, which are actually kind of rare. School, school world problems, fantasy problems, and uh, fairly decontextualized ones. And uh, I'll get into the decontextualization issue in a second. But among the other three categories, well, let me get to that in just a second. I actually have a nice graph about this issue. Let me go on a slide, and then if there are other questions, I'll come back to them. So outside of this factor, one other feature was statistically significantly associated with gaming, and that was whether the flow of problem solving, where to start and where to go next, is either is both not directly indicated and doesn't follow standard conventions. And in those cases, gaming was more frequent, which again might relate to your concern about floundering with the interface may be seen as gaming, although I think largely floundering with the interface wouldn't lead mostly to the kind of, as I think about it, 
wouldn't lead to probably system, uh, systematic guessing behaviors. It might lead to systematic guessing behaviors in the interface, but it probably wouldn't lead to trying one, two, three, four, and so on. Potential answers. So the lack of text and problem statements. As I mentioned, having more text and problem statements means less gaming. Or conversely, less text and problem statements, more gaming. And that breaks into, does the problem have a context at all, or is it just a mathematical equation or expression, like in Aplusix? That's relatively rare in the cognitors, but we do have some lessons of that nature. And if there is a problem statement, how much text is in them? So that text could be world of work text, it could be school kind of scenarios, it could be fantasy. But which one of it, is it doesn't matter. But when you include both these things in the model separately, they're both significant. What you get is, if you don't have a scenario at all, if it's just kind of core math, like in Aplusix, there's fairly low gaming. If you have a problem with lots and lots of extraneous text, kind of stuff outside of math that's fairly colorful, there's low gaming. But if you have a hokey problem, you know, the classic two trains are, are going down the, the, the track, what time do they meet? A problem that kind of has a little, a few words of extraneous text, but it's really kind of just math, and the cover story is very thin, very high gaming. And that's a statistically, this group is statistically significantly different than the other two. So when we put all these features together, the combined model achieves an R square of 0.56. It, it explains 56% of the variance in gaming. And that's over five times better at predicting gaming than the best prior model of the relationship between student individual differences in gaming. Which to me is a really nice nail in the coffin of something I worked on for a couple of years. You know, I, I really think that this is where the action is. That in the design of these tutors, and in some relatively small scale differences between them, like how much extraneous text you put in the problem statement, there's a real difference to, how stu to student behavior and correspondingly to their learning. So the future work I kind of alluded to, the first thing we want to do is take it, the worst tutor lesson out there, the most gamed one in all of cognitive tutor algebra, the one that has as many as possible the features associated with higher gaming, to our luck, that turns out to be the same one. The most game lesson of cognitive tutor algebra also has several of these features present. <coughs> Makes sense with an R square of 0.56. We're going to fix the tutor, redesign it so those features are no longer present. We're gonna, it has lots of hokey problems. We're going to make the problems very rich and engaging and design them, you know, work with a teacher and the curriculum designer to do this. It has very, unclo very unclear flow through the problem. We're going to make the flow much more clear. We're going to I have a PhD in HCI. Hopefully, I can do something along those lines. Um, we're going to take those abstract, uh, un ineffective hints and use uh, knowledge of best practice of how to make hints effective. We're going to do all these things and hopefully make this tutor lesson much better in all these ways and make it much less gamed. And um, if we succeed, this will kind of, I think, form the basis of a whole new approach to reducing gaming the system non-intrusively. Rather than having these agents or some of the other things people have done, like pop-up metacognitive messages, um, or making hints and feedback less effective for all students to prevent a small minority from gaming, we may be able to redesign tu design tutors that students just don't choose to game at all. And as you were asking, I think a key next step, after we validated this in this learning environment, because I do think we want to do it here first, is to test out some of these rules in other environments and see if the same relationships hold. We don't have to do the entire process. We can code just these features and see if they still predict gaming. So I want to move on to some conclusions. So gaming system does not appear to be something that some students do, which was kind of the majority view for a while. It instead may be something that educational software designers like me inadvertently cause through our design choices. And the model is kind of software designed to affect to gaming. So my th current theory for why students game um, theory is a little bit of a grandiose word here, but uh, it seems a little too well-founded to be a hypothesis anymore, <laughs> is that if you have insufficient attempts to make the material interesting, the student gets bored. And then they game the system, and then they stay bored. And if you have an unclear UI, or ineffective or overly abstract help, the student gets confused, and they game the system, and they don't learn the material. <laughs> but we can fix it. And we can move towards designing educational software that students don't choose to game at all. And more broadly, this type of approach may be useful, generally useful, in studying the antecedents of user behaviors and how users move to the various strategies of usage. Despite having a PhD in HCI, I really have done almost all of my work in the educational domain. So I don't have uh, kind of deep analogies to make. 
But, uh, but part of the reason why I was excited to have a chance to present this work here was uh, from the possibility that there might be some opportunity to converse with some of you and learn about uh, whether this might be a promising approach. And more broadly, and I, I mean this more for the educational designers, but this may be applicable for design of other types of interactive systems as well, what kind of small-scale design choices are we making that inhibit the effective use of the software we create? Clearly, design goals are going to be different for different types of software. Um, but nonetheless, inefficient and ineffective use occurs everywhere. So some other ongoing projects at WPI's Educational Psychology Laboratory, just have a quick commercial as long as I've got everybody's attention. <laughs> We're working to automatically detect off-task behavior uh, when a student is not even engaging with the software at all anymore. We can actually detect the difference between that and if a student is off the system talking to the teacher, but what occurs immediately before and after a pause. Um, detecting slipping, when a student makes a mistake but actually knew the material, they just kind of made a careless error and uh, whether knowledge is shallow or deep, whether it can transfer out of the learning system. We're looking at designing the optimal flow between concept learning and skill learning. So software that uh, leads students through practice, but also uh, goes through activities that help them get a deeper, richer conceptual understanding of the material. We're looking at intergroup differences in responses to educational technology uh, in the United States in urban, suburban, and rural settings, and across different nations and cultures. We've actually got nine countries running a study later this year within the next year or so. Uh, one already done, one in the Philippines running right now to try to investigate further. You know, we've seen that off-test behavior is way rarer in the Philippines than in the States and that gaming system is, sim is similar. When we see these kind of effects, and most of the educational research cross-culturally has been uh, either qualitative or pairs of countries, and it's hard to really figure out what factors it is that causes these differences in what students do when it's only two cases. Because we know off-test behavior is rare in the Philippines, but there's a million reasons why that could be. But as we get a large sample of countries, um, we can use things like Hofstede's cultural dimensions and the World Values Survey and demographic and development data to try to figure out which differences between countries are driving uh, these kinds of differences in student behavior. So I'd like to thank all of you for all your great questions and comments and any others you may have. And I'd like to thank all these folks for the very important contributions that they made to this research. And thank you for your attention.